Now, I like the history, and one thing I want to go over briefly is the history of epigenetic research, and this is from my perspective now. I got into this field in the early 90s, and what I have here is plotted publications, total publications, as a function of time, year, <clears throat> and on a linear uh, graph. So what I did for this is I wanted to show that Basically, up until around the year 2000, there's an inflection point right around 2005, right in here, where it looks like basically nothing really is happening much in the field of epigenetics, to the point where it's actually going vertical and a lot is happening in the field of epigenetics. Now, if you plot this rather than on linear paper, semi-log paper, what you will find is that what I'm showing is an exponential growth curve for publications in the field of epigenetics. And that in the scientific community, there's a doubling of the epigenetics papers every one and a half to two years. Last year alone, we put into publication somewhere between 15 and 20,000 papers, which took us 15 years from 1990 to 2000. This lecture was about the growth of epigenetic research and how looking at a linear chart, there was hardly any research being done up until the 2000s. Now publications have doubled to 15 to 20,000 papers being published in the, two, in the later 2000s than in the earlier 2000s. The lecture showed a linear graph to compare this information. Overall, we can see that this research has grown. This is a bomb calorimeter. This is the actual piece of equipment that researchers use to calculate the energy content of either biodiesel or maybe even the potato chips that you had for lunch today. When they calculate the amount of energy, they're going to calculate it in heat units, which would either be joules or calories. I want you to look inside the bomb calorimeter. Inside here, you can see that there's a silver bucket. Water goes all in here. And this is actually the bomb. It's a smaller silver cylinder. What you do is put your fuel sample in there. Then, these two electrodes are connected to the bomb. These provide the spark that will ignite your sample. When your sample burns or combusts, that gives off energy. So how is the energy collected? or how, do, how does a scientist figure out how much energy is being given off? Well, it's a closed system. There's a lid here that goes on top of this calorimeter. And what's in here in the lid is a stirrer. The stirrer is going to stir the water that's in this big pool here so that the heat given off from the sample is going to warm the water in a uniform way. This is the temperature probe. This goes down in the water also and measures the change in temperature because as the sample is burned, it will give off heat and the temperature of the water will increase. So the lid goes on, the sample is prepared, the last thing that you need to make a combustion reaction happen is oxygen. And at some point during the process, some oxygen is added by a tank that's connected to the calorimeter here. So we are going to burn a sample of the biodiesel that you've prepared and get some feedback on the energy content of it. You'll be able to use this to compare it to petroleum-based fuels like octane. This lecture was about how, to, um, how energy is found and how to calculate energy um, within a biodiesel context. So energy can either be um, joules or calories, and what happens is they put um, whatever they're testing, so in this case potato chips, into um, a silver bucket 
they use a combustion source to um, test what kind of energy they The key to forming strong brain architecture is what's known as serve and return interaction with adults. In this developmental game, new neural connections form in the brain as young children instinctively serve through babbling, facial expressions and gestures. And adults return the serve, responding in a very directed, meaningful way. It starts very early in life, when a baby coos and the adult interacts and directs the baby's attention to a face or hand. This interaction forms the foundation of brain architecture upon which all future development will be built. It helps create neural connections between all the different areas of the brain, building the emotional and cognitive skills children need in life. For example, here's how it works for literacy and language skills. When the baby sees an object, the adult says its name. This makes connections in the baby's brain between particular sounds and their corresponding objects. Later, adults show young children that those objects and sounds can also be represented by marks on a page. With continued support from adults, children then learn how to decipher writing and eventually to write themselves. Each stage builds on what came before. Ensuring that children have adult caregivers who consistently engage and serve in return interaction, beginning in infancy, builds a foundation in the brain for all the learning, behavior, and health that follow. This lecture was about serve and return, building uh, learning behavior within the brain. So the lecture explained that um, children and adults build emotional and cognitive intelligence and skills by repeating and looking at sounds and then facial expressions. Continued support throughout children's development helps encourage learning, behavior, and strong health outcomes.